group over and decide if it is something you want to be a part of. Look at it as stated goals and the actual products that it is achieving and then decide if you actually want to be a part of that group and to what extent you wish to be a part of any group. But even before you can do that, you do have to decide who you are and what is important to you. The right to life is an intellectual endeavor. It is not something that can be achieved without your participation. If you don't know what life is for you, you will never be able to express or experience your right to life. My guest today is Sharon Angel, author and lecturer. Sharon has written a book about how to shed the identity hoisted upon the individual by society. Sharon's passions lies in bridging societal divides between people of different status, faith, caste, race, age, and gender. Her goal is to voice the concerns of the destitutes and help facilitate their journey towards rehabilitation, employment, freedom, and peace through her work in media and justice. Welcome. Thank you. That was a beautiful introduction. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. And thank you for being here today. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and, and have you share everything you're doing with our audience. It's just incredible. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. So um, tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up? I am Indian American. I was born and raised in South India. And I recently have moved to California for my work. I am a child of immigrants, so I was raised in the Christian faith. And a big part of my life journey is kind of divorcing from performative religion, cultural expectations of who and what a female individual should be, and also a lot of the uh, pressures that have come with my last name. So I've been on this journey to <laughs> detach from all the negative um, pressures that was thrust upon me and live my life in freedom and also advocate that freedom for others. Excellent, I love it. And so just what was your childhood like? I want to say it was beautiful <laughs> on the outset but during my teenage years is when I lost a loved one and that was the trigger to many of the unprocessed emotions and the grief that was inside me. So that kind of pushed me to work on those triggers, work on that loss. Um, I was given an opportunity to study in Canada and that's when I moved out of the country. And when I did so, I found my love um, in my career at work in media. I used to host television shows, I used to host um, kids TV shows. So kind of found that love back again. And while I was working, while I was studying, I was able to work on my emotions, the peer pressures. What do I believe in? What do I stand for? And going on that journey, I was able to find out and narrow down what my yeses are, what my noes are, kind of detach from all of these pressure to, pressures to say, if I am not this person or if I don't want to be this person that um, society demands of me or society tells me to, who do I want to be? Mm -hmm. So making that jump from who I am to who I want to be, who I should be, has been the greatest, best experience, the best journey of my life. Also came with some pitfalls, some failures, but failures are the greatest stepping stones to success and finding who I am, where my values lie, where my yeses lie, where my noes I have strengthened my identity and have also showed me how much courage I have, how much courage I should have to pursue this freedom because freedom is valuable. Mm -hmm. It very, very much is. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so you ended up, so you're in Canada and now you're in California and yes. so what distinctly brought you to this great state of California? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the opportunities to work. I have my own video production company here. So after finishing my bachelor's, after finishing my master's, you know, there's that funk of, okay, mm -hmm. what am I going to do next? Mm -hmm. Everybody's looking at me. I now have this degree in my hand. So I had pitched an idea to start a company, a video production company at my um, 
in my master's, one of the master's classes. And then after I graduated, I was like, why don't I just you know, start this company instead of just keeping it a dream? What's the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. Fail, mm -hmm. you know, at least let me try. So I registered the company and uh, just started making videos, taking pictures for people in my friend group. And then I saw that people liked them and they approached me word of mouth and became you know, a business and now it's kind of transformed, taking the path into a company. So California, a lot of my um, friends who went to film school with me, they are here and I thought this would be a great place to produce documentaries, tell stories that I want to share. So I just took a leap of faith uh, pack my bags, whatever I had in my bank account, <laughs> moved here, and I guess I'm now living the dream <laughs> <laughs> of being a California girl. <laughs> to some, no, I'm just playing, <laughs> yes. So California is, you know, like any state, it's an incredible state, um, definitely has some areas we need to work on. Yeah, I'm sure we're all aware of that, yes. but it is, it's a, it's a cultural place to live, yes. that is for sure. You're well cultured when you live in California and you have the beauty of the state. Mm -hmm. um, and so you wrote a book a few years back called The Courage to Identify. And can you tell our audience a little bit about it? Of course. So The Courage to Identify Who You Are is a little bit of my story of where I was born, how I was raised, what I was exposed to. and why I exactly wanted to break away from who I was because in many ways uh, I had everything that a young girl could want um, but there was that you know little little voice if I can say my conscious I just couldn't I was not okay with you know like there I, I felt like there was more so it's about that journey of taking that leap of faith to explore what is on the other side. What are these nudges? So I write about why we need the courage to find our identity because it's scary, it's daunting. You never know what's on the other side. You could fail or you could become a great success of actually knowing who you are. So I talk about um, say no to an arranged marriage. I talk about the bullying that I went through, the cyber bullying that I went through. I talk about uh, money decisions in many parts of South, e South Asia and Middle East. Women are not taught how to handle their finances because it's usually the male, um, the men in the family who take over the family um, finances. So how I kind of struggled with that, taught myself those lessons. And major league crimes against women uh, when those happen, how do you deal with that? Do you let that define you? Do you let that narrative define you? Or do you break away from it and define yourself away from the shame, away from the guilt? So I talk about, I tell a little bit of my story, but also bits and pieces of navigating the no's that we need to say through finding our identity and what that looks like. So I released it in 2020 during the pandemic when there was so much uncertainty mm. and so much fear, not just with young people, but people of different ages, people of different races, mm -hmm. different backgrounds. So I thought sharing my story of how I went through that would be a little spark of hope, a little spark of comfort to say, okay, I need to break away from this, but what does it look like on the other side? So giving that little picture of kind of the big picture concepts of what freedom looks like and why you need the courage. Um, I wrote that book and with the success of that book, I was al also able to start a podcast to break those big concepts down into smaller bite-sized pieces, taking mm -hmm. everyday decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, what do those decisions constitute? Mm -hmm. So that is why I titled it The Courage mm -hmm. to Identify <laughs> Who You Are. For sure. And is your family still in... Southeast India? Yes, they are in India. Uh, they are Christian missionaries. So I come from a line of Christian missionaries. Um, and uh, they do a lot of mission work. They travel, they speak, pray, uh, and so on. So I try to visit them as much as possible. Um, but sometimes it's not possible because I have my work here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but it's been in the recent years, it's been beautiful because we've we've been able to work on our relationship mm. uh, to have those conversations. And mm. I think that is so important mm-hmm. in today's day and age, because we as we grow older, we're all making different decisions. And sometimes we find out that, you know, my opinion is different from my parents or my mm-hmm. grandparents or even my siblings. Mm-hmm. We might be raised in the same generation. We might be raised the same way, but we think different. And we want to execute our faith or express our thought in a different way. So what does that look like when siblings are getting married, siblings are choosing a different job, wanting to move to a different country? What does that look like? At the end of the day, how do we all come together to respect each other's opinion, discuss how we are different, Mm -hmm. and also have the compassion and the listening ear to understand the other person's perspective. There's no one perspective to an issue. There are two different perspectives. So how do we understand that and come together? So having those conversations with my family, whether they come to visit or whether we're on the phone for hours together or when I'm able to go and visit, having those conversations have helped my journey of finding my identity and also having that support system of there are certain things maybe I I would do differently or they would do differently. But how do we find that middle ground where we can respect, love and support each other? Yeah. So that has been a vital part of the journey. (laughs) For sure. And it's it's it is a vital part of life. Mm. Right. You talk about yeses and nos and your own sense of integrity. Right. Moral and compass. But then how are you able to um, share a viewpoint that's different from those that you love and care about and want to be around. So, yes. you know, I think it's the backbone to human relations, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so that's... And doing it amicably instead yeah. of fighting, instead yeah. of coming from a place of anger. Yeah, For sure. I am curious. So you, you touched a little bit on or you mentioned the arranged marriage mm. and it's definitely, you know, it's a cultural thing and, yes. you know, I have the utmost respect for everybody's culture is that something that when you talk about breaking away from that you did in the end if so um how how did you don't say specifically how you handled it with your family Mm. but you know yeah it it could be a uh, barrier yes so it is definitely a taboo to say no to an arranged marriage because it's so cultural Mm -hmm. um everyone gets an arranged marriage or they get set up to get an arranged marriage and that is you know at a certain age whether it's a young man or a young woman Mm -hmm. um, all the aunties and uncles will come and say okay it's time to set you up (laughs) and time to get you married and usually you know the young men and women go along with it because it's cultural so in the same way i was set up to meet someone to marry someone but after being in that conversation or being in that Um, realm of okay I am going to say yes to a stranger and then as we've talked about our cast the class system the monetary value um, dowry even you know I just something didn't sit well inside me to say there's no relationship here there is no you know if it's a man and a woman getting married for you know saying yes for the rest of their life where is the emotion? Where is the mm-hmm. um, human aspect, the mm-hmm. human element? And I think it has been lost over years to over the years to kind of glorify the caste system, glorify colorism, glorify the dowry system. And it becomes materialistic in many ways. And I just couldn't, you know, just didn't sit well with me. So at that point, I had to make a decision. Are you going to just go with the flow just like everybody else and say yes and then hope things will get better after you get married or are you going to raise your voice and tell people how you feel what you think (laughs) and i think option two is difficult (laughs) because for sure it's arranged marriage has been happening for generations Mm -hmm. and it is such a cultural thing in india in the middle east you know you don't go against it Mm -hmm. but thankfully i had family members or I have family members who were open to listen to my thought or, you know, where is she coming from? Why does she want to say no? What is her opinion? And having that conversation to say, no, I think this is very materialistic, uh, methodical, and I don't feel that 
I want to say yes to an arranged marriage. Um, saying no to it and taking a stance to say, I don't want to be part of this system was a big battle in my life. And also be consistent with that narrative to say, um, whoever I want to be suitable with, whoever the partner is, I, I'm happy to wait. So uh, taking that decision and you know, saying no to an arranged marriage has given me peace and assured me to be in the freedom of who I am, who Sharon is, and also gave me the courage to say, yes, this was a big risk. This is a big risk that I've taken, but I am at peace. I have um, the freedom to say, I, I'm, I'm able to choose life mm -hmm. for myself. I'm able to choose liberty for myself. Mm -hmm. And also, understand and relate with others who want to break away from systems like that. I understand where they're coming from and be of support, even if it's just emotional, mental support, I'm able to give them or allow that freedom or just be with them in that at that time. Um, so yeah, I'm happy I did that and able Great. to say that I'm at peace. And that's excellent. Being able to do that. Yeah. yeah, excellent. I just was very curious. Mm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you kind of touched on it, but it is an interesting point that, you know, based on the color of our skin and mm. the, our cultural background and the clothes we wear and things of that n nature, that it's this predisposed um, idea that we have specific beliefs or that we're supposed to act a certain way or have certain position, uh, opinions, um, which in life couldn't anything be farther from the truth, right? Mm. We are individuals and, and certainly uh, you've chosen a different path, and how did you go about that? I think colorism is a very interesting concept, and I think it dates back to so many years. Um, especially in India, when it comes to marriage, the dowry, you know, how, da how much dowry is demanded or how much dowry is given depends on the color of a woman's skin. And I think that's the most degrading and dehumanizing um, aspect of life because if she's darker you demand more dowry and but if she's lighter you just you know accept her because she, that's what that's the beauty standard um, and in, in and in many ways the caste system class system also plays into that and the human element of how can you define somebody because of something that they have no control over um, being born into a lower caste or being born into a background that is not as affluent. How can you define someone um, because of that and also tell them that you cannot break away from it because this is what life has destined for you? I, I don't agree with that. And if someone works toward it, I think the, the person, the individual has to allow that freedom for themselves. And I think it be begins with a thought. It begins mm -hmm. with accepting that your conscious is saying this is wrong and you can break out of it. One sentence that has been resonating with me recently recently is, if she can, she will. Mm. So if a woman wants to break away from it and say, I want to get a better education, I want to go work at another place, I want to become an artist or a teacher, she will if she wants to. But that comes with the thought and the realization that there are hurdles, there are consequences because you're going against the grain. You're going against generational rules and regulations and traditions and rituals. So are you strong enough to face all of that, even if your family is, has decided to disown you, if society has decided to treat you as an outcast? Are you ready to take those on? and honor your life as a human first instead of seeing that you are subhuman. Mm. Honor and value your life first to see that, to say that I am female, I can only do so much. Um, so I, I, I think it starts with personal realization and the decision to break away from everything that you don't believe or you don't trust to be true. All right. Yeah, it's interesting as you're, you know, extremely valid points and I'm, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question about women empowerment or, mm -hmm. or just being a woman, right, and taking away those barriers and what I can relate it to. So I was a um, basketball, college basketball coach for 13 years and I played at wow. the Division One level and 
uh, growing up in the era that I grew up, right, you grew up playing at the park with the boys. Mm -hmm. And it was never, you know, it was never a thought in my head that I was a less of an athlete or a player because I was a girl, yet it was told to me by boys when playing, right, because they don't want to lose to a girl, right? And mm -hmm. I, anyways, I started a whole brand, and I'm not going to mention it on here <laughs> because no pro for profit things, mm -hmm. but that, um, you know, we are the standard. We can also be the standard yeah. in relation to anything. And, um, you know, I, ex I experienced it trying to get a higher level level coaching jobs immediately mm -hmm. if you're a young female it's like your resume just mm -hmm. you know it's like mm -hmm. right and the young males are getting hired and mm -hmm. things of that nature and so um as you're, you were talking about that you know that's my relation to it in the professional right. world yeah i experience a little bit i've aged so the i don't get the Beautiful. young oh, i appreciate <laughs> that very much um you know so you're, you know, the, the points that you've touched upon in regards to um, things that are happening potentially in a different culture, not but India, and, and but how have, I'm curious how it's transferred over mm -hmm. to where you are now, um, and if you run into those things, and how do you not process them, but, you know, they're no's for you, like that's what you refer right. to them to, no's and yeses, and, mm -hmm. and how that works for you. I think... So culturally, it's the voices in my head. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's patriarchal or matriarchal, it's society telling me this is who Sharon should be. And if she strays from it, then she is a rebel. She is all kinds of names, fill in the blanks. But that negative voice was always in my head to say, because you're a daughter of this person, because you are a female from this culture, because you relate to this religion, you need to be all of these things. So breaking away from it, whether I was in Canada, whether I've been in the US or when I go back to India, it's my choice to say that I will listen to these voices or I will not listen to these voices, but I will listen to my conscience which says you are you have the right to life mm -hmm. you have the freedom to choose you have the uh, freedom to live to be who you truly are who you have identified with um, so regardless of whether I'm in India whether I'm in the US or Canada I think the biggest battle would have been breaking away from those voices because obviously when I go back there there are questions of oh you're this this age how successful are you in life and depending on the communities that I hang out with here in the US um, those questions are kind of similar mm -hmm. because culturally and religiously um, they are kind of the same things that float you know it doesn't matter which bubble you are in those questions are bound to come in different ways so it is a battle to choose whether to listen to these voices or to listen to these to the to our conscience and i will also say with the whole women empowerment thing um culturally from in the indian culture women are raised to be a certain kind or you know mm -hmm. women are raised to be you need to do the dishes you're mm -hmm. meant to have kids at this age you need to be married take care of the in-laws and so on but there is no stereotypical or there you know men are not taught the same but imagine if men and women were taught in the same way, for example, when it comes to financial decisions, mm -hmm. how to save, how to budget, how to spend your money, if both of them were taught the same way. Or when a son and daughter come home after school, both of them go into, uh, instead of saying, the girl needs to get water, a simple example, the girl needs to get water for the guy. What if they both go into the kitchen, get whatever they want to drink, get whatever mm -hmm. they want to eat? Um, and have that equality, mm -hmm. have that freedom to, I want something, I will go get whatever I want, regardless of me being a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we don't have those freedoms or if we are not taught those freedoms or if those are conversations are not had at home, then it might be difficult to navigate the real world. Because today, I always think about if we want to have a successful family, if we want to have a successful relationship, then the man and the woman need to contribute to the relationship, to the family building, to the unit. 
and in many ways economically as well it's there it we're, we don't live in a time where only the man brings in mm -hmm. uh, a salary or an income the woman has to also bring in an income and sometimes we both need two jobs three jobs mm -hmm. um our partners and our spouses need to donate or you know contribute to it economically emotionally and mentally as well so both of them need to be available and i think that comes with um, how we are raised with the conversations that we have at home all of those things matter if we practice equality if we practice freedom if we have a safe space to entertain these conversations i think um, growing up regardless of which country we move to mm -hmm. which uh, culture we're in then it becomes easy for us to navigate um, mm -hmm. so we don't have those strongholds in our head right yeah and you know it's i know we're specifically talking about you know the, the culture that you were brought up in and we could take a broad spectrum look at this and, mm. and just say you know there are certain cultures not necessarily races but cultures where um it, it, the morals and the ethics that are being taught and um uh, spoken to to the young children are not the most survival right life mm. of crime drugs but that's what they see, right? And that's mm. kind of like um, what they're around and maybe their parents do it, right? And so, mm. you know, you, could, you have the same perspective of the kid can be like, he's kind of outcasted if he doesn't take or follow that life, mm. right? And, and I think we can really, like the way you're expressing it, it's very easy to relate to. And I think that's an incredible, um, talent and very good when we're talking about something like this and mm. it is relatable in every negative societal uh, group mm. culture um, you know community that that doesn't have necessarily letting that individual have that right to their life to their freedoms their beliefs their religions and not be persecuted um, not be oppressed mm. Um, not be outcast yeah. right and, and it's just um, it, it's so simple but it's so powerful thank you it's just so so powerful and so um, in today's show we're obviously talking about human right number three right the mm -hmm. right to life and your right to an identity that you choose right the right to your own opinions uh, to think freely or act freely, to have your own goals. And what kind of advice can you give to people who feel trapped by uh, opinions of others? One is, I would say, allow that freedom for yourself. There might be generations of this is how you should be. No one wants to be different, right? It is so scary and fearful to be different. When you choose, or even the thought of when you see something on social media, or when you read something, immediately your gut will say, oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't participate. But to actually put that into action is so difficult mm -hmm. because that means you have to stand against the grain. Mm -hmm. You have to be different. Your voice would be, if you said something, your voice would be aloof. It would be alone, just echoing into nowhere. <laughs> um, but when you have those gut feelings when you have that intuition i would strongly say encourage it and allow that freedom for yourself because you are valuable you are necessary you are needed so allow that voice in your head that says you have life flowing through your veins flowing through your body allow that for yourself and instead of simply just existing do something about it try to put your words into actions. And instead of taking large steps, take small steps. Okay, if I want to say no to this, what does that look like today? So I would say start with small steps. And um, what the simplest thing to do is when someone is voicing their opinion, when somebody is sharing their thought to say, I feel like there's something wrong here, or I, or I feel that something wrong has been done to me, listen to them without any judgment. And that is so powerful to just mm. exchange a conversation with someone who they might disagree with your beliefs, they might disagree with the core of who you are, 
But just listening expands your perspective on so many things. Mm -hmm. So listen with an open heart, with an open mind. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to agree with the other person. But there is so much healing when a story is shared. Mm -hmm. Mindset changes. Hearts are healed. Mm -hmm. So open up your mind to just have a conversation. And that is so powerful. And I always say oppression it's not just people who oppress you. It's not just the patriarchy or the matriarchy or um, cultural, religious um, organizations that oppress, but also everybody who doesn't say something against that oppression, say no to that mm -hmm. oppression being allowed, or people who kind of also allow that oppression to happen or feed into that oppression are also oppressors. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that somebody is being oppressed, you are being oppressed or a whole group is being oppressed, don't play into it. Don't allow it to happen. Um, and it just takes one, one person and then another person will join in and another person will join in and it collectively becomes a group of not allowing that oppression to happen. Anything that starts small, it starts with one step. And I strongly believe in the power of thought. Mm -hmm. When you have a strong thought, whether to say yes or no, encourage it. That's where life begins. That's where freedom begins. And that's where peace also begins. Powerful. Thank you. Extremely powerful. Don't be silent. Trust your gut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But absolutely. Absolutely. And so what kind of reception does your opinion, like what have you gotten? Now I've gotten an overwhelmingly positive response. I'm happy to say that. And I think that's because I took the time to shut down and, you know, really analyze, really work on my triggers. So I have become, my yeses are strong, my noes are strong. And people see that there's consistency. My, my support group, my close friends, they see that there's consistency. So there is respect, you know, when you say something and when you, and when you live that life, when there's action following that word, there is respect. And that is the message I try to push to people. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. That's why I have the podcast. And that's why I try to break down everyday concepts into bite-sized pieces. And it's all decision making. It comes down to everyday decisions. Um, so I try to push that to people to say, if you have something to say, follow it up with action. And it's not to be conceited or it's not to be um, to say that I did this, so everybody needs to follow me. But it's more of peace for you, value for you, freedom for you. So I'm happy to um, have different organizations, different spaces open up where I'm able to share those thoughts, share my belief, share my experiences and my story and able to connect with people who maybe don't have a voice, who maybe are going through, I don't know what to do, that kind of toss up, that imbalance, being in crossroads. Um, I'm so happy to listen to stories, you know, when people share them, whether it's an, over my DMs or they write to me or in person when they share their stories of um, this is what happened to me. I read your book. I listened to your podcast and I was able to be free. Those stories give me immense joy and um, I'm super happy to hear them um, because allowing that freedom for someone else or opening that door, opening that window, that space for someone else to practice their freedom is so valuable. And I have so much delight when I hear about those stories. And I'm happy and thankful for all the platforms that have opened up um, as I've shared my story. Yeah, absolutely. And have you run into any cultural roadblocks along your way? Yes. Uh, I think when I said no's, um, the no's were difficult. <laughs> Um, I had prepared myself, you know, culture and religion. Um, these are two institutions that have been practiced over the years, for many years. And I was, I told myself I, that I shouldn't be oblivious to say I can, you know, take this on by myself. 
um, and you know try to change concepts or change um, theories that have been practiced for over the years. That's not what I'm here for, but at least practice those freedoms for myself. Um, to say the rituals, the traditions, the things that I have to do, that I must do, that I should do, I don't need to do them just because it's on paper or mm -hmm. just because um, that's the way it should be done. Um, so I've had, you know, when random people say things, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. It's easy to brush them mm -hmm. off. But when close ones come and question, hey, why do you think that made you made that decision? Or what was the thought process behind that? That was, that was my biggest battle. That has been my biggest battle to explain to them, this is where I'm coming from. Um, I'm grateful that people were open to come and ask me that question because I think that takes bravery mm -hmm. and courage because you can lose that relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, so those I've been able to have conversations with, I've, I've had people in, in my life, those people I've still been able to keep in my life. But there are some who, without having those conversations, without, um, when they assume that I am part of this group, I believe in this, when they just assume um, we've had to cut our relations. And now looking back at it, it is sad, mm -hmm. you know, because there is a, a sense of loss. There is a sense of cutting things away from your past. Um, and there is a grieving process to it as well. Mm -hmm. But that's what makes you stronger mm -hmm. because it's almost like um, that road to freedom is a much more clear, uh, a much more wider path um, to have freedom for yourself. Who knows, I might meet them in the future. <laughs> I might come, uh, you know, come across them in the future, but I would be in a much better place to say, hey, let's have a conversation, what happened to us? Uh, so no regrets there, but um, those, again, I stress that those who I have been able to have a conversation with, our relationship, our bond has been so much stronger now. And I am grateful for those relationships because that's my support system. That's where I gather my energy from. So it's been good. That's excellent. Yeah. Very good. Um, and so moving forward, what is next for you? Do you have any um, things specific coming up? I know you have a yeah. podcast and a TV show. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to go ahead and just touch on that. Sure. So the podcast itself is talking about concepts like peer pressure, grief. Um, I dedicated so many episodes specifically for women's women's rights, the issues that women face. Um, and how do we navigate that? Because on a larger scale, we know it's wrong, but how do we navigate that on a daily basis? So I would like to continue doing my podcast um, to bring on experts, share my story, my view, um, what are the statistics? How can we practically take on these freedoms? How can we practically uh, make these decisions. So in, in my podcast, I talk about those concepts and kind of go in detail in, into the depths of how can each person practice that freedom for themselves. So uh, the Courage to Identify podcast is continually what I would like to do. Excellent. I love it. I love it. Great. And so if someone wanted to get a hold of you, you just mentioned your podcast, right? It's yes. called The Courage to Identify, and I'm assuming that's on all platforms? All or? platforms, okay. all streaming platforms. Uh, they can go onto my website, SharonAngel.com, and look at all the things that I am up to. I, we have a few projects coming up, but I'm keeping in hush-hush. <laughs> I think they can see it when they um, go take a look at my podcast or follow me on social media platforms. I'm always, you know, updating the things that I'm doing. Um, but I would love for your audience to listen to my podcast. I think that'll be valuable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, um, of all the different rights listed in the Declaration of Human Rights, which one resonates with you the most? I really like Article 18, the right to the choice of belief, your mm -hmm. thought, conscience, and freedom, mm -hmm. and specifically the right to be associated with the faith or not, uh, with the religion or not. And I think that's very interesting because that stems from mutual respect. 
um, as we talked about, you know, we are raised a certain way in during our childhood years, during our formative years, there is a certain mindset that we have. But as we grow older, we make our own decisions and we are exposed to kids in school, mm -hmm. um, then our career, you know, we are exposed to so many different people. And there comes religion, there comes society, there comes politics, media, and we're all taking it in. But then we have to make a decision at the end of the day. What do you believe in? What do you not believe in? What does your belief system consist of? Mm -hmm. How is your conscience, your morality? Where do you, where is the compass pointing north? Where, what is your right? What is your wrong? What is good? What is evil? Where do you draw the line between ethics and morals? Mm -hmm. All of those questions, as we grow older, those decisions just become harder by the day. And to be able to say that just because I associate with this religion doesn't mean I agree with everything this religion says. Mm -hmm. Just because I come from this culture doesn't mean I practice everything that this culture demands. And just because I'm part of a political party doesn't mean I agree with all of those stances. Mm -hmm. And media and technology, they are such a big driving factor in this day and age. Mm -hmm. We can get so easily influenced by it. But how do we limit ourselves to say, I stand by this, but I don't stand by this. So all of these decisions, so complicated, so big and you know, it can be daunting and that's why it causes so much anxiety, depression, thoughts of suicide, mental health is, you know, mental health crisis is on a rise today. Mm -hmm. But the answer to all of that is finding the core of your beliefs. They can be a, a series of saying yes to certain things and series of saying no to certain things. And also allowing yourself to say, just because I come from a certain background or come from a certain group, doesn't mean I have to agree with anything. You can formulate your own identity. You can formulate your own core belief. And that is what defines who you are. And um, I love the article 18 because um, it gives access to that freedom of thought, freedom of conscience and freedom of belief. And I'm a strong believer that when we define those core beliefs, that when we have our belief system strong, then um, we won't be succumbing to succumbing to anxiety or mm -hmm. depression or confusion. I think we'll be we'll have the courage to take the risk to say, I don't have to face anxiety today. I don't have to face fear today. I don't have to face uncertainty today. Um, when we take the time to define ourselves, will make us so strong. And I think that freedom, that right is so beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Very well put too, very, very well put. <laughs> you have an eloquent way of speaking and it's um, very picturesque, right? Mm -hmm. It really relates. So um, definitely encourage everyone to check out your podcast and um, decide for themselves what yes. their wrongs and rights, morals and ethics, and all that good stuff really be self-determined so i want to thank you very much for taking the time for thank being you. here and thank you for what you're doing and putting out the content and information um, for helping individuals it's uh, very relatable i think to any person that walks this earth so thank you so much i'm so happy to be here yeah excellent well that's our show for this week i hope you enjoyed today's episode and you got tremendous amount of information out of it as I interview all of these wonderful people and different guests and look at